here. Father, God, I pray today, Lord, for, Lord God, for your will to be done. I, I thank you, Lord, for men and women who love you. And God, they, they come back every week, Lord, ready to serve you, ready to hear your word. Lord, they're eager to grow. And God, I'm so grateful, Lord, that you've given us such a lovely church family. God, they really have a heart for people. God, I thank you for those that go on outreaches like yesterday into neighborhoods that are difficult and drug infested. And Lord God, for those that go to minister to young men, Lord, that have made their mistakes. And Lord, they've presented the gospel to them. And I just thank you, God, for the heart of this church family. And God, I pray for new people as they come in, Lord, that they would sense, God, the, the, that your heart is here and that, God, that the moving of your spirit is here, that, Lord, that, that God, I pray that everybody that's here, Lord, would know that, Lord, that we're about Jesus, Christ and him crucified and bringing the good news to people that don't know. God, I pray that this would be our heart. We pray these things today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amazing passage for 1 Corinthians. I think that uh, just to think about this for a moment and go, go with me. First, I went one chapter too far. Okay, here you go in verse, um, uh, verse 38, I believe, no, 39. It is, yeah, here, here we go. It says, so dear brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and don't forbid speaking in tongues. And in verse 40, be sure that everything is done properly and in order. Now, after three chapters of going through the operations of the gifts of the Spirit, Paul comes to the end of it, and he brings it down to two things. And he says, don't, don't forbid speaking in tongues and prophesying. And then he says, and let everything be done decently in order. Can I just bring your attention to something? Here we are 2,000 years later, and guess what the church is still dealing with? People who believe that the gifts have passed away, and so they forbid speaking in tongues. And then other people who believe in the gifts and the operations of the Holy Spirit, but things aren't done decently and in order by the word. Now, I'm just saying to you, I don't believe that this is a salvation issue. Uh, I, I, if, you know, for people that come along and think that because maybe a group doesn't uh, believe or operate in the gifts of the Spirit that somehow they're not saved, that is absolutely wrong. Listen, this church will always, as long as I'm the pastor, <laughs> will always be focused on Christ and him crucified. It is about the cross, it's about the blood, it's about salvation, because that's the message of the New Testament, amen? And anytime that a church starts to talk more about the Holy Spirit or the move of the Holy Spirit or the gifts of the Holy Spirit or miracles, I just want to say this to you. Something has gone awry because the focal, Paul said, that I determined to know nothing among you except for Christ and him crucified. That is the message that we have. The gifts of the Spirit are simply there to help propagate the message of the, the cross and of the blood of Jesus and for what he accomplished for us at Calvary. Amen? So we're always going to preach the death and the resurrection of Christ, and we never, ever should lose that. But the gifts of the Spirit are given to enable us, to help us, to empower us, to fulfill the Great Commission. That's why those gifts have been given. It's not so one group can go, sit over and go, oh, I got it, or we got it, or they don't got it. Uh, it's, it's so that Christ and the message of the gospel can be preached to the ends of the earth. Amen? And some people that uh, will, will look at these scriptures or the moving of the Holy Spirit, they, they kind of think that it's either mystical or, um, you know, maybe unnecessary. I don't know if you've heard people come along and say, well, you know, it's kind of strange or odd or unnecessary. But listen, if the Bible says that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are necessary, then they're necessary, <laughs> okay? It's not for me to tell God what's necessary and what's ne ne not necessary. It's his job to tell me what's necessary, and then I discover what he says is necessary, and then I walk in it, amen? Amen. So um, I just want you to, uh, we'll go more into depth. I actually, right after service this morning, I had somebody that came from a uh, completely non-Pentecostal background and more questions than answers, but he's seeking truth. And all I ask you is this, come with an open mind and a heart, wherever your background is. We have varied backgrounds, but um, I can tell you this, I have made it a uh, journey, uh, searching in my life to find, and to find that place of what the scripture says and then to live in it because I believe that if you go either direction, I believe that there's pitfalls. We want to find the truth of God's word and we want to walk in God's word, amen? 
So, uh, so some people look at the moving of the Holy Spirit, they look at it as a destination. Now, l- let me say this to you. For people who are, uh, that don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit, but they get saved, it, many people come to a place and they go, well, I got the Holy Spirit, I'm saved, uh, I got it. I believe that that's wrong. I, I believe that rather than looking at the working of the Holy Spirit as a destination, look at it as a journey. Folks, listen, everywhere in the scripture, people went on a journey with God. Abraham went on a journey with God. Moses went on a journey with God. Mary and Joseph took a journey, and God used that journey. Look at the move and the work of the Holy Spirit more as a journey than as a destination. If if, uh, you have been uh, or have come out of Pentecostal churches, uh, sometimes people look at the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. I know as a youth pastor, you know, kind of the churches that I was in when I was uh, younger in ministry, uh, you would always hear this. You would hear people go, I got it, I got it, I got it. And it used to bother me because, listen, I, I got it is wrong. It's wrong on a couple levels. First of all, I don't got it. I have him. And if I don't have him, what is it? <laughs> okay. The Holy Spirit is a person, and when the Holy Spirit works in power in your life, you don't have it, you have him. Amen. Amen. And let me take that a step further. Rather than saying, I I have him, how about we say, he has me, right? (laughs) Because I don't know about you, but uh, I, I think Jesus is always trying to get me rather than me trying to get Jesus. If he can get into this life, and get me to be compliant and work with him and follow him and serve him. That's really the question. More of what I can get uh, is more uh, than, than him coming in and seeing what he can move and do in my life. So I, wa- I want us to have correct thinking about the working and the operation of the Holy Spirit. But let me ask you this question. Because some people come and they go, well, you know, we really don't need the gifts of the Spirit. You know, this passed away or that passed away. Let me just ask you a question. If they needed the gifts and the operation of the Holy Spirit in the first century, why is it that we would think that we don't need that today? I mean, honestly, today. Do you think that we don't need discernment in the church? Does anybody think that our culture... Our Christian culture needs discernment. Thank you very much. How about gifts of faith, gifts of healing? I I mean, the the work and and listen, even to get away from gifts like that and think about administration, righteous administration of the church, words of knowledge, prophetic, um, serving, encouraging, giving, uh, helps. These are gifts of the Holy Spirit that we need working in the church. And when the church can begin to operate in these in a righteous way, in a godly way, will that make the church then become smaller or less powerful? Or will it become larger and more powerful? I submit to you that when things are done decently and in order and scripturally, but the church finds the gifts and the operation of the Holy Spirit, it will not then make us somehow become emotional or uh, somehow hyped up or somehow weaker. It can only make us more powerful. When God's work is done God's way, it produces God's results. So as we look today, I want us to start looking at these things as a journey. Galatians 3, 1 through 6, you can go and read it later. Uh, we also will put it on the overhead. But Paul is talking to the, Galatians, the church in Galatia, and he says, listen, he said that the working of the Holy Spirit, did it come by keeping law? And he was like, absolutely not. It came by faith. So I want to tell you, the same way that you were saved by faith is the same way that the gifts and the Holy Spirit operates in our lives. It's by faith. Faith, it's not by works. And he says, he, he goes on to say, does miracles, does the working of God in your church, now this is some 20 some years after the day of Pentecost, and still these things are vibrant and alive and the miraculous is happening in the church. God is doing great things. And, and even in that day, he, he looks and he says, D- does that happen because of the keeping of the law? Have you first been made right by a salvation by grace, and now it's dependent on on you to work this out. And he says, God forbid. 
It's only by the working of the Holy Spirit that comes by faith. And church, here's what I'm saying to you is this, is that the same Jesus that saved you is the same Jesus that wants to fill you, that wants the gifts and the operations of the Holy Spirit to happen in our everyday life. We need it in the church. Uh, we need it in the workplace. We need it in our homes. We need it in our marriages. So I want you to see in John 1.16, uh, Jesus, or this is said about Jesus. It said, from his abundance, we have received one blessing after another. Can anybody say amen to that? We have received one blessing after another. You know, last week, uh, between services, I was coming in. You, you know, sometimes I'll go in and freshen up between services. How many know I need to freshen up every chance I can get? <laughs> uh, and uh, sometimes I'll come in right as service is beginning of the first few moments, and I was coming in, and from the time that I hit the door to the time that I got to my seat, I was stopped by five different people. And I had one person stops me and says, Pastor, I want to let you know uh, I have completely been healed. I had cancer. This week I went in. The doctors told me I'm completely, there's no more cancer in my body. Praise God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I had another person say to me, hey, you prayed for me, Pastor, a few weeks ago for a job. I got a job. I want to tell you financially, God is blessing my life. I had another person that stopped and said, I just want to tell you, God is working my marriage. I had another person. It, it was five times I got stopped from there to, to right here of people saying what God is doing in their life. I want to tell you, you say, Pastor, what, what gets you going in life? What is it that you love more than anything in life? Listen, I love my wife and I love my kids and thank God for my family. But listen, in ministry, there is nothing that I love more. I thank God for the building. Thank God for all you people. But listen, the thing that clicks in me more than anything is when I find a person and somehow they get it. Somehow their eyes open up and they go, hey, this thing is real. And God is working in my life, whether they get saved or they have a new, fresh revelation of Jesus. Praise God when the light comes on. Amen. And there's a lot of lights coming on, so thank God for that. And listen, I've been a pastor for years now, and you know what my prayer is? God, let another light come on this week. Let another light come on. I don't ever want to stop. I want the, the full revelation of who Christ is and what he came to do. I want that in my life. Can you say amen to that? So, uh, so we, we, we look and we see that, that God, he's wanting to work one blessing after another blessing in this journey. Uh, turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 14. I quoted this passage last week, but I really want to go through and read a little bit more thoroughly. I want you to see this, if you would. Verse 16 of chapter, oh, went to the wrong place. Where am I going? 14. Oh, no, I was in the right place. Okay, there we go, 14. When I freshened up, I should have put my markings back in the right place. Here we go, chapter 14 and verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. You have one advocate, and who is that? Jesus. And then he says, I'll give you another advocate. An advocate is, any of you ever been in court? You don't have to raise your hand. But, <laughs> but if you ever happen to go to court, which uh, before I was saved, uh, I have been in court. Actually, right after I got saved, I was in court. And I had an attorney. That was my advocate. Listen, the scripture says we have an advocate in heaven, the one that pleads our case and fights for us, right? So we have a prosecuting attorney. That's the devil. He prosecutes us. And then we have an advocate, which is Jesus. But then Jesus says that I'm going to give you another advocate, which is the Holy Spirit. And he will never leave you. Never leave you. Somebody's got to claim that today. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into some truth. No, all truth. The world cannot receive him because it is, he, they are not looking for him and they do not recognize him. Listen, the only person that can re receive the Holy Spirit is someone who sees Jesus. When you repent of your sins and you ask Jesus to be your Savior, that's the person that the Holy Spirit is revealed to. So if you're here and you're not a Christian, you've never asked Christ, then you do not have the Holy Spirit. But if you're here today and you, out of your heart, you repent and you ask Jesus to come into your life, the Holy Spirit 
comes inside. The way that Jesus is alive inside of you is through the Holy Spirit, that advocate that he has sent to you. And he says this, he go, Jesus goes on to say, but you know him because he lives with you now and he later will be in you. So I want you to see this. He's saying, listen, the Holy Spirit has been with you. He's talking to the disciples now, red letters. He has been with you, but later he will be in you. And I want you to see that because Jesus had not died on the cross and he had not raised from the dead, so there was no, the, the, the fullness of what Jesus came to do in the forgiveness of sins had not happened yet. So even while Jesus was on earth, the Holy Spirit was with them, but he could not come in them, okay? And now he's saying, in a few days, I'm going to go to the cross, and the, the, you're going to get another advocate, and the Holy Spirit is going to come in you. He has been with you, Old Testament. He will now, he is going to come in you. Can somebody shout hallelujah? Amen. So now he is coming in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you also will live. That is shouting ground stuff right there. He says, because I resurrected from the dead, now you have the resurrected life. So when, so when Jesus died and then he resurrected, that's exactly what happens in the life of believers. Listen, the old John Bailey died. Praise God. You don't even know how lucky you are. You would not want that guy to be your pastor. Okay? <laughs> Trust me. The old has passed away. And now all things have become new. Because Jesus lives, you live. Because he's alive, you're alive. You see this? Now we live the life of another. I, it's, it's not what I can do. It's what he can do in me. Because he's alive, I am alive. Since I live, you also will live. And when I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. How, how is he in us? He is in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit and Jesus are inseparable. So now Jesus is alive in you through the Holy Spirit, the fullness of God. Hallelujah today. There's no question. People that go, well, I don't know about Jesus living in you. Just take him to that passage. You can't read it any other way. Now, go with me to Acts chapter 1. And I want you to see this. He's talking about the Holy Spirit being with you in the Old Testament, in you as salvation. But now in Acts chapter 1 and, and 2, we start talking about the Holy Spirit coming upon us. So he's in you, but then he's going to come upon you. Old Testament with you. Now, as believers, he's in us. And when he is in you, you are completely saved. You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You don't get more saved when he comes upon you. When he comes upon you, he gives you the power to be a witness. So if you look at Acts chapter 2, uh, just real quickly, uh, in verse 4, it says, Don't leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift as promised, I told you before that John uh, baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized, submersed, immersed with the Holy Spirit. So he says, John the Baptist baptized you with water, but when the Holy Spirit comes, he is going to dunk you. Just like these guys got dunked, if you could just see that as the Holy Spirit, he wants to not just get inside of you, but he wants to dunk you. And when you come out, you are covered outside, inside, all over with the Holy Spirit. That's what he wants to do. And Jesus says, wait until this happens. Go, go down with me to verse 7. It says, the Father alone has authority to set those dates and times. Uh, they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witness telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. So he's saying this. Hey, the Holy Spirit is in you, but now he wants to come upon you to be a witness. Hold this and go to Acts chapter 8, and you're going to see a beautiful picture of this where all the pieces, I, I believe, will come together, and you'll see with you, in you, upon you. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it's so that you'll be a witness to a lost world. Uh, here we go in Acts chapter 8. This is the revival in Samaria with Philip. There had been a great persecution in Jerusalem. Everybody scattered, and Philip shows up in Samaria. And it says this in verse uh, 4. 
It says, but um, the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria and told the people there about the Messiah. Crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear the message and see the miraculous signs that he did. So now, understand this. Uh, there, Jesus had already gone to Samaria. Uh, he met the woman at the well. The woman at the well went back and said, look at the man. You know, so there was already an awareness of who Jesus was. But now Jesus had died and resurrected. Philip comes and he starts preaching. And everybody's listening to him. And great miracles are happening. Wonderful things are happening. And, and many people are listening to the gospel. Go with me to verse 12. It says, but now the people believed Philip's message of the good news concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. As a result, many men and women were baptized. So I want you to see this. They, they hear the gospel. They believe the gospel. It says that they believe in Jesus. They believe in the kingdom. They accept the message. So much so that Philip, who's an evangelist, discerns in his heart, these people are truly born again. Are you supposed to get baptized before you're born again? No. Okay. The young men that were here today that were baptized, the 13 of them, I said it to them in the early service. They were here for the preaching. And I said to them, listen, you're not getting baptized to get saved. You're getting baptized because you are saved. So Jesus has already done a work in your life. And now this is a testimony to show everybody what Jesus has done in your life. So you get saved first. The Holy Spirit comes in. And then you get baptized. You don't get baptized to get saved. You get baptized because you are saved. So Philip looks at these people. They accept the message. They believe the gospel. And then he baptizes them. Now let me ask you this. Are they saved? Yes. Do they have the Holy Spirit? Yes. But watch what happens. Go down a few verses. And I want you to see this in verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there. Now, this is why they did it, because the Samaritans had intermarried. They weren't true Jews, and they were concerned, how can the Samaritans be getting saved because they haven't kept law? At this time, you know, they didn't have Paul with the great re revelation of salvation by grace uh, through faith alone. So they send people to go, can these, you know, these people that have intermarried in marriage, can they really be saved? So Peter and John come to check things out. When they got there, they don't rebuke, uh, they, they don't rebuke uh, Philip and say, hey, Philip, you missed it here. But they come and they see what God has done. As soon as they arrive, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the question. Did they have the Holy Spirit? They got baptized. Does anybody here find a doctrine anywhere in the Bible that says that, hey, I got saved, I just didn't receive the Holy Spirit? That's craziness. <laughs> when you get saved, you are born again. That's what makes you saved. So they had the Holy Spirit in them. And I want you to see this. They were, they were saved, but the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon them. So look at the wording here. He says that they had not yet received, uh, they, um, they had not yet received, Excuse me. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard uh, the message, they sent Peter and John. As soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come, look at the word, upon any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. But how, who gets baptized? People that have been born again and they are saved. So now the prayer is, is that the Holy Spirit would come upon them. Then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers and they received the Holy Spirit. I believe what they received was the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon them to be witnesses. And then it says that Simon uh, saw that the Holy Spirit was given. He saw God do something in these men's lives and there was something that struck inside of him because he saw the working of the Holy Spirit. If you go through this, the passage in Acts chapter 2, when they began to speak in tongues. There's other places. Uh, Paul, for instance, when he first is prayed for, he's healed. Uh, but listen, when people are baptized in the Holy Spirit, incredible things happen. And it does all through the New Testament. Uh, I want to give you a picture of this. Go, go back with me to Luke chapter 10. Everybody with me today? 
Luke chapter 10, and I want to read a verse here. I love this verse. I love every verse, but I really like this verse. It says, at the same time, Jesus was filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, how do we know the, he and the Holy Spirit were one? But he, in this moment, was filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Can we put up the word here? Because I want you to see this word is agaleo. This is the word in the Greek. It is to exalt, rejoice exceedingly, be exceedingly glad, to jump with joy. So he didn't do the uh, whole, oh, I'm so happy and I'm just glad here today. Y you know, most of the movies and TV shows that I saw about Jesus for years when I was a kid, it was, oh, Jesus was always, he always moved really slow and he always talked really slow. So he would always be, he would always be like this. Come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And you're like, hello, is anybody in there? You know, like, do you know what I'm saying? And it's the picture that we've gotten, but I don't know if it's a great picture. Listen, Jesus had emotions, and he had real emotions. Okay? Praise God. He was angry with the, with the, the, with the uh, religious leaders uh, in his day because they wanted power more than they wanted to get a hold of God. He was frustrated with the disciples because uh, he asked them to do things and they seemed to be like, he'd tell them five times and they're just not getting it. Uh, anytime that God gets a little frustrated with me, I'm sure. Um, you see other places in the Bible where he weeps because uh, he comes to Lazarus' funeral. There's times that he's amazed at the greatness of faith by a centurion. I want you to see, I believe that he was very emotional. I believe that he was a person, I don't believe that he was like, you know, up, you know like, like crazy emotional, but I think that he had emotions and they were real physical emotions. And in this place, it says that he got, now he wasn't just going, oh, I'm just so happy today. We're talking about he was shouting for joy, hallelujah, amen. In Psalm 139, there's the Hebrew word that kind of uses the same word there. And the way that it's used in, uh, in that place is it says that, that Hebrew word um, is to spin and dance in great joy. That's what I'm saying. And sometimes we go, hey, well, then we sometimes get in church and then everybody seems like they've been sucking on lemons. And we're going, hey, I want to tell you something. The Holy Spirit wants to give his people joy. Jesus had joy. It's okay to be alive and have emotions and have joy and have love and have peace and sometimes be frustrated and sometimes go through things. It's just real. I'm not talking about fake. I'm not talking about hype or manipulation. Listen, when we get up on the worship stage here, we don't have people constantly going, okay, now everybody, now everybody. Listen, I don't want that, and we will never have that. Not because I don't believe in emotions, but I don't want it to be orchestrated by people. I, yeah, listen, you guys, have been, I know all of you have been in, in church somewhere along the line, and the pastor comes up and goes, now I know you love football, so when you go to the football game, everybody get excited about football. And if you can get excited about football, you should get excited about Jesus. And then everybody for five minutes or for five seconds gets up and goes, ah, you know, like, like they're at a football game. Can I tell you, I have no desire at all to ever do that. And I have no desire uh, for people to just do things. I don't believe that, it, that God in heaven is up there going, wow, looky there. They love me as much as football. How about we get the joy and the life of God because we love him and because we know him and because we're full of the Holy Spirit and not because somebody is telling us what to do and how to do it. How about it's just real? We don't have to wear plastic masks at church where we put on faces like we're happy. How about we find real joy? You, you want to say, you, you want to know why so many teenagers fall out of church? You know why? Because they walk into church for years and they see people acting plastic. And they go, you know what? If I got to be plastic, no thank you. 
They need to see something that's real from the heart of God. Real joy, real life, real peace. That comes in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you, young people, whether you see it in me or anybody else, it's real and God has a plan and he wants to fill you and he has more than just a plastic life that he wants to, to live out. It's real. God is real and the power of the Holy Spirit is real. And Jesus stops in this moment and he is full of joy. Now, the question is this. Why was he so excited? What was it that happened that made him so excited? I, I won't read through all of it because we don't really have the time, but you go back and read it later. Go back to Luke chapter 9. And you'll see at the beginning of the chapter is transfiguration. R write these notes down. Go back, please, and read it later. And Jesus takes Peter, James, and John on top of the mountain, and they get up, and he shows them his glory. Now, here's the way that it works in the Bible. God shows you his glory. He shows you how great he is. And then he goes, now take that and pass it along to somebody else. That's any place in Scripture. So they come off of the mountain, and the next thing that they have happen is that there's a boy that's demon-possessed. And so Jesus says, hey, here's a little boy. Can you cast the, demon to, cast the demons out? What happened? They're, they're trying and trying, and finally the father comes over and goes, hey, you know, I don't know how you run this business around here, uh, but <laughs> the guys in the mechanic shop, they don't know how to change tires. Uh, <laughs> You got the, <laughs> these guys don't know what you're doing. My son's demon possessed, Jesus. So Jesus comes over. He casts the demon out, but he's frustrated. He's going, guys, I'm showing you my glory. Not so you can just get it and hold on to it. I want you to get my glory, and then I want you to live it out. So he's frustrated with them. If you go through, right after that, they stop and they have an argument about who's the greatest in the kingdom of God. I want to tell you how bad this is. First, they can't cast the little demon out. Then they're arguing over who's the greatest. It is, it's the equivalent of somebody that can't hit a free throw shot in basketball and they're talking about how great they are as a basketball player. If you can't hit a free throw, then you're probably not the greatest that ever lived. Amen? These guys, Jesus gives them a little task. They can't do it. And then they argue about who's the greatest. And he's like, really? So then he starts to talk to them about commitment. Hey, this is what it's going to take. You're going to follow me. You're going to have to die to you and live to me. Right after that, in the beginning of chapter 10, he takes 72 aside and it says this. It says that he prays over them and he tells them to go all across Israel and to preach the gospel. He puts them off in groups of two and he says, now I'll give you authority, a power. Go out and I want you to pray for people. I want to see the sick healed. I want to see demons cast out. I want to uh, see the gospel preached and go and do this. So they leave. Now, let me just say this. I believe that this is a picture of the church. I believe that if you look at Acts chapter 2, it's what will happen a few chapters later. He gives them power and authority. I mean, Matthew 28, I give you power and authority. Now go and preach the gospel to the nation. So it's a mini picture, but it's before the cross. So the Holy Spirit was with them, but he was not yet in them yet. Are, are you with me on this? So he, he sends them out. Now, let me just say this. People that go, you know, are there demon-possessed people? Absolutely. There are demon-possessed people in America and overseas. Now, I, I believe that the reason that we don't see as much demon possession in Western Europe and in, in first world countries is because, listen, the greatest trap that Satan can get you into is to be an atheist. If you don't believe in anything, uh, that's a great place for him, for you to be at. So why possess you with a demon. Now, you find that in the third world, places where there's voodoo and other things, witchcraft. I believe that there are certain elements, but listen, why, why, why try to take somebody who doesn't believe in God at all and fill them with a demon? Just let them be, and they'll live, and they'll die, and they'll go to not heaven. So then they, they die, and they go to hell, and the purposes are fulfilled. But listen, we do. I've dealt with demons here in America and overseas, and I want to tell you this. We have power over the enemy. L look what happens. They come back in verse 17. Read with me here. It says that the 72 disciples return. They, they joyfully report to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. Now listen, they couldn't do it on their own. But when we use your name, we can't heal anybody. We can't cast the demon out. Jesus is the one 
who casts demons out, and Jesus is the one who heals. But when we use your name and authority and power, great things happen. And then Jesus responds, and he said, yes, he told them. I saw Satan uh, fall from heaven like lightning. Uh, look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them, and nothing will injure you. But don't rejoice because the evil spirits uh, obey you. Rejoice because your name is registered in heaven. And then the Holy Spirit fills him with joy. So here's what happened. He comes, these guys come back and they go, man, it's great. You prayed for us. You gave us authority. We went out. And great things happen. People are being healed. People are coming to the kingdom. Demons are being cast out. Jesus, this is amazing. And he stops and he says, listen, don't rejoice because of that. Just rejoice because your name is written in heaven. All pride dies. Amen. But I want you to see this. Then he gets so excited and full of joy. Why? You know why? Amen. Little brother. Why does Jesus get so excited? Because the 72 got it. They got it. They heard the message and they got it. He did a work in them and then they took the gospel out to people that are around. They lived beyond themselves. A uh, few years back at a, a Starbucks, I believe it was in Portland, something happened. I don't know. Has anybody ever been to Starbucks and somebody buys you a coffee and you're like the next person in line and you're like, oh, thank you very much. Anybody? Anybody ever done that for anybody else? Has anybody ever been to Starbucks? Okay. Oh, I forgot. I forgot. We're, we're uh, what do you call it? We're, uh, yeah. Yeah, we're boycotting it. So, okay. So you don't go to Starbucks. But here's what happened in Portland, Oregon. 27 people in a row. Praise God. What is going on today? Time that we cast out a few demons, right? now. Uh, 27 people in a row are going through Starbucks. And the first person comes and says, you know, I want to bless the guy behind me. I'll pay for my coffee and the guy behind me. Guy comes up behind him. Hey, the last person paid for your coffee. You know what he does? You know what? I'll pay for the guy behind me. The next one, oh, well, that's great. Next lady goes, I'll pay for, the, pay for the person behind me. And it goes on 27 people. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? Praise God. I want you to see this. That's what Jesus wants. He says, listen, I want to bless you. I want to give you power and authority. I want to bless you in an amazing way. And then I want you to pass it on to the next guy. And then I want you to pass it on to the next. You know what gets me with that story? Is who is that 28th guy? <laughs> 27 free coffees. And he's the guy that goes, hey, thanks a lot for the coffee. The next guy can fend for himself. Thank you very much. Think about that. Who wants to be that guy? I want to find his name. Because if they're going to keep track of the 27, they should have get, you know, they put the names on the side of the cups. They should have been like, oh, what's your name? Because we're putting it in the paper. It's going to go out on the internet forever <laughs> so we can remember who you were. 27 people took the blessing and passed it along. Number 28 said, no, I'll take that blessing, not passing it on to anybody Thank you very much. Do you hear me today? Jesus is like that. Who wants to be the 28th guy? Who wants to be the guy that goes, yeah, I got mine, and that's all that matters? Jesus, when he got so excited and full of joy is when he looked at the church. He looked at these, he looked at these 72, and he gave them power and authority. They went out, and God did great things, and they come back, and they're rejoicing because their names are written in heaven. And he's like, this is the dream. This is the very reason that I came. If you want to get this, here it is in a nutshell. This is the dream that God had, that I would send my son and he would die on a cross. And when he dies on a cross, everyone who believes in him would receive the power of the Holy Spirit, the life of God, everything that we need for righteousness and godliness. God determined in his heart that we would receive it. That is part of the dream, that the dream is fulfilled when the Holy Spirit comes upon us and then we pass it on to somebody else. And Jesus goes, now they got it. It's not just about what I can do in them. It's what they can pass along through the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the fullness of the dream. 
the Holy Spirit in you, the Holy Spirit upon you, and he wants to touch a lost and a dying world. Who wants to be the 28th guy? I don't want to be the 28th guy. Do you hear me? I hope you hear that from heaven today. Today, church, I'm finished with my message. Worship team, you can come up. I believe, I believe this is the message that we need to respond to. And first off is this. There's some people that are sitting in this room today. I know it. I know it in my heart. I, I know it in my heart that you're here today, but you have lost the joy of salvation. Maybe life is hard. If you look at Jesus where he was at, where he's wedged in between arguments and fighting and uh, pa, uh, the, the, the disciples not listening, right after that he has a fight. He's in the middle of a bad day. But you know what? He got full of the joy of the Holy Spirit. If you have lost that joy of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to tell you what, God wants to reveal that inside of you. He wants you to get a hold of it. If you go through life and you're like a placebo politician, you know, everything's moderate. Let me watch my words. Let me watch the way that I live and what I do and what I say. How about we just get a hold of the life and the presence of God? And we can, we can rejoice with those that rejoice and we can, be, and we can weep with those that weep. But we're real, genuine, authentic people full of the life and the presence of God. That's real. Somehow in the church, we've got a hold of something that's a little bit plastic, and we've tried to pass it along. And I think that the people out there are going, hey, dude, I love you and everything. I don't want anything. I've seen so much plastic religion. They're looking for something that's real. And I'm telling you this. If you ever get something real from God, I don't care how bad the office is, I don't care how bad the home is, I don't care how bad the situation is, God can change the situation if you get full of the power and the life of God. That's why he gave the power of the Holy Spirit, is to change the life that we live and where we're at. And we gotta take, we gotta take and start paying for the guy behind us. Do you know, not at Starbucks, don't go there. Go, go to Urban Bean. Is that, did I get the number right? Urban Bean, yeah. That's the people, those are the Christians. So. There's other people that are here today. And you're sick in your body. Maybe you're here today and you're going through a desperate time in your marriage. I want to tell you today, if you're depressed, if you're broken, if you're full of heartache, God has power today. He wants to give it to you. He wants to give you the strength and the power and the life of God is here for you today. Do you hear me? This stuff is real. Man, I, if, if, I, if I had to make it up, trust me, I'd be doing something else. I, I, there's, there's, there's too much in me about what's right and what's wrong. I'm not going to stand up here and deceive people. Listen, I've been to the well and I've drunk the water. I've, I've been to that place with Jesus. And he's done a work of joy and peace and the love of God. And I'm telling you, don't stop. God has so much that he wants to give. If you just start to come to a place in an honest way and go, Jesus, fill me. God, help me. I can't do this on my own. Jesus, I need your joy, your peace, your love. He'll give it to you. Would you just bow your heads for a moment right with your head? Jesus, these are your people. You love them. You gave your life for them. Lord, I can only think in heaven, Lord God, that when you see the lights come on in our life, that you still in heaven rejoice and you're full of joy and full of life. You're, you're our great interceder. You're our advocate. You're fighting for us. You're believing for us. God, I pray today, Lord, that you would take your people today and change them, change our lives. God, let lights come on today. God, I pray for me today. Lord, I need new lights to come on in my life. Jesus, we desperately need you. Praise God. If you're here today and you need God to, to do something in your life, whether it's healing or helping with your marriage or maybe you just need joy, you need a peace, you're troubled in your mind and you just need the joy and the love of God, whatever it is, and you're here today and that's you, will you just raise your hand because I want to pray for you today. Thank God. I believe that Jesus wants to meet you right where you're at. Let me ask you this as well. How many of you would be here today and you would say, Pastor John, I don't want to be number 28 guy. 
I want to take what Jesus has done in my life and I want to pass it along. I need the power of the Holy Spirit to take what Jesus has done in me and let the Holy Spirit come upon me so that people can see the greatness of Jesus. And Lord, I don't want to be number 28, God. I want to be a man or a woman of God in these last days that's walking with you. And maybe I don't understand everything. Maybe I don't even know in my own mind how to get there. But God, I know this, that you're always what you speak is true. And I pray today that you would help me to walk this life out. If that's you, will you raise your hand because I want to pray for you today. Yes, so many of you. Let me ask you this. I want you to stand to your feet. And everybody, if you just raise your hand or if you just need a touch of God, I don't want you to wait for anything. I just want you to begin to move out and come and stand around these altars. God is in this place. We'll ask our pastors and prayer team if they would to come and pray for people as well. But I want you to come. I want you to come. If somebody starts to pray with you, you can just tell them, I need healing. I need joy. I need the peace of God. I need help in my marriage. I, I want to be that person that passes along the gospel. I don't know what to say. You may be here today and you go, Pastor, I've gone through this before and I get to the place I feel so, I feel like such a failure when it comes to this area. Understand this today. It's a journey. Nobody here is pointing fingers at you. All I'm saying to you today is whatever the weakness, whatever the difficulty, get on the journey, get on the path and just begin to say, Lord, here I am. Do a fresh and new work in my life. I don't want it to be fake. I want it to be real. Real. God, do a real work in me. If that's you, I believe that Jesus is here and he wants to do something real in every life. Jesus, we love you today. God, move in this place, Lord, by the power and the strength of God. In Jesus. Praise God. How many of you know that Jesus is in this place today? Praise God. He's here today. I'm walking around and praying for people today. Listen, I understand that the issues are real. Folks, if you think that I'm insulated, I've walked through many dark paths and many places in the course of my life that's not been easy. There's one thing that I've found. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. God has given me power over serpents, over enemies, whether it's the flesh, the world, the devil, every power of hell, God has given us the victory. And in the midst of those dark places, in the midst of those dark paths, somewhere along the line, you have to stop and say, God, fill me with the joy and the life of the Holy Spirit and give me the power and the strength to walk through these things. He will do it. He's able to do it. Father God, I pray, Lord, in this place today, Jesus, Lord, for the life and the presence and the joy, Lord, of Christ to fill every heart here today. And God, I pray, Lord, as the Holy Spirit dwells in us and now comes upon us, Lord. God, let us be those people. Lord God, that, that, Lord, as you come upon us, that we don't hold it to ourselves, but we pass it on to somebody, to somebody in need. Lord God, I pray that your joy would be full. We love you today. God, we pray these things today in Jesus' name. Church, can we just give him praise today? Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God.